Welcome back to MCB 170, Society and the Brain. This is lecture 16, which corresponds to part two of module eight. The title of module eight is Us Versus Them. In module eight, we're discussing the human tendency to form groups around shared characteristics and the biases that develop between groups inevitably. In part two, We'll be, we'll be facing the difficult subject of prejudice, primarily racial prejudice. But before we get there, I want to discuss sea slugs. Why sea slugs? The reason will become apparent shortly. This is a diagram of the sea slug, Aplysia. This is actually species Aplysia californica. So it's an aplysia that lives in California, in the surf in California. It's basically a snail without a shell. And so its skin is pretty tough. It's kind of leathery. It's getting buffeted around in the surf, so it has to be kind of tough. But it breathes over a gill, and the gill is a very delicate organ. It exchanges gas with the water, and it allows the aplysia to get oxygen from the water. It's also a tasty morsel for fish. Fish like to swim along and feed on the gill of aplysia, which would kill the aplysia. So the aplysia has developed a reflex called the gill withdrawal reflex, where if the gill or the surrounding tissue is stimulated, it'll withdraw. Of course, the aplysia can't breathe if its gill is withdrawn, but at least it has prevented its gill from being eaten by a fish. But what if the stimulation is not noxious? What if it's not threatening? What if it isn't dangerous? What if it's just, what if the gill and the mantle and the associated tissues are just experiencing, you know, water currents due to being buffeted by the surf? Well, then you don't want to withdraw the gill. You want to leave the gill out. So the aplysia has developed habituation of the gill withdrawal reflex. What does that mean? That means that with repeated mild stimulation of the, of the mantle and the gill, the gill withdrawal reflex will get less and less and less. That over time, if the stimuli are not dangerous, if they're not threatening to the life of the aplysia, the aplysia will habituate its gill withdrawal reflex. Its reflex will get smaller and smaller and smaller, and the uh, gill won't withdraw again if the stimulation to it is mild. Now, if a big fish comes along and starts to bite the aplysia, then immediately it'll resensitize this reflex so it can withdraw its gill again. But in the short term, it's habituated the reflex so it can continue to breathe over its gill, even though it might be buffeted around in the surf. How is this relevant to racial prejudice? Well, it turns out that we have a, we have a reflexive, almost, fear response in our amygdala. The amygdala is associated with fear and the amygdala will become active in the presence of fearful stimuli. It turns out that the amygdala fear response will habituate. In this particular experiment, human subjects were shown photos of people from their in-group or their out-group. Let's put this in racial terms. White people were shown images of white people from their in-group or black people from their outgroup. When an individual sees a photograph of a stranger, that's initially kind of threatening, and it activates the amygdala. The amygdala is about here and here on both sides in this MRI scan. So subjects were in an MRI scanner. The scanner was looking at the structure and function of the brain. They were shown photographs of the stranger, either in their in-group or their outgroup. And in all cases, they had an amygdala response on that first scan, whether it was an in-group or an out-group face. But they then saw the same face, the same photograph again. And if it was an in-group face, the amygdala response habituated. It got less. If it was an out-group face, the amygdala response did not habituate. How do we interpret this? Well, we would have to say that the subjects found a stranger's face a little bit threatening, 
On a second presentation, if that stranger's face was from their in-group, they didn't feel as threatened. And the response to the amygdala went down. If the, the face was from their out-group, they still felt a threat and the amygdala response was still high. The fear responses in the amygdala, which can in indicate our automatic reactions to certain stimuli, can be studied on the behavioral level using the implicit association task. Now, this is a kind of a benign example of the task. In this case, we have two choices, John and Mary. And the subjects are shown a stimulus image, in this case, a jackhammer, and in that case, feather dusters. And the subject has to very quickly press the button they think is most closely associated with the image. In some cases, individuals can earn money if they guess the correct owner of the item in the image. So if you were shown a picture of a jackhammer and you had to very quickly choose between John and Mary, and you might even get a monetary reward if you chose the individual to whom the jackhammer actually belonged, you would probably press John for the jackhammer. Likewise, you'd probably press Mary for the feather dusters. Now, after you did that, because you're doing it so fast you can't even think about it, after you did that, you might have felt a little bit badly. Like, was it a stereotype response to press John when I saw the jackhammer and Mary when I saw the feather dusters? That might very well happen in your mind, in your brain. And it's a very, very nice example of the interaction between automatic and controlled processes. Your automatic response was to associate the jackhammer with John and the feather duster with Mary. But maybe on, in a controlled way, you thought about that later. And maybe your thought process was, was guided by your internalized desire not to feel prejudiced, not to stereotype on the basis of sex. I'd now like to discuss a very important experiment. This is by Cunningham and co-authors, and this is your reading for the week. This is a fantastic article, this Cunningham article in Psychological Science from 2004. It's your reading for the week. This article shows better than any other article I can think of, better than any other of your readings, the interplay between automatic and control processes. It shows automatic processes that are racially biased and controlled processes diminishing those racially biased reactions, automatic reactions, under the guidance of internalized desires not to be prejudiced. So I'd like to go through this experiment in some detail. Amygdala activity in response to outgroup faces may correlate with automatic biases, but this activity seems to be modulated by input from higher centers control processes. In this experiment, they used white subjects who all disagreed with prejudice statements and had, quote from the paper, internalized desires to respond without prejudice. However, on average, these subjects showed automatic negative associations toward black relative to white faces on the implicit association task. So the subjects in, the, in this experiment are pretty much like we are. We have internalized desires to respond without prejudice. And that internalized desire can guide our controlled processes. And these controlled processes can control automatic biased reactions. Here are more details on this important experiment. Images of white and black faces were then shown at two intervals, short and long. The short interval is 30 milliseconds. The long interval is 525 milliseconds. What's a millisecond? A millisecond is one thousandth of a second. So one second has a thousand milliseconds. 525 milliseconds is about half a second or about 50% of a second. 30 milliseconds is only 3% of a second. 
That's fast. The responses in the subject's brains were very different if the, if the images were shown at a brief interval or at a longer interval. At the short interval, 30 milliseconds, white subjects showed increased amygdala activation in response to black faces. This was correlated with their score on the IAT. So those automatic biases that they couldn't control because they happened so fast showed up in the amygdala as increased amygdala activation in response to black faces. They also showed decreased activity in response to white faces. So the automatic response in the amygdala was opposite for black as for white faces. But at the long interval, amygdala activity decreased for black faces and increased for white faces, bringing amygdala activity closer together for black and white faces. The decrease in amygdala activity for the longer interval was accompanied by increased activity in dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and anterior cingulate cortex. Right, our hero prefrontal cortex and its sidekick, the anterior cingulate cortex, which mediate controlled processes, become active to control the automatic response in the amygdala and bring the response for black and white faces closer together. These findings suggest that controlled processing in prefrontal and anterior cingulate cortex can override automatic processing in the amygdala. This shows us that indeed we can internalize moral values and ethical principles from culture and, you, and they can guide our control processes to control our automatic responses in a way that's more consistent with our beliefs and values. Here's the data. Again, from Cunningham, you're reading from it for the week. This is the key. This is the key figure. We see an MRI scan, structural and functional, different parts of the brain that are activated when a white subject views an image of a black person. Here's the amygdala here. These other, this is probably the fusiform face area down here in the temporal lobe. Here's the amygdala right here. Amygdala is active. On this, in this graph, you see a comparison between the responses at the short interval for black and white faces and the long interval for black and white faces. The short interval dashed lines. For black faces, amygdala activity increases. For white faces, it actually decreases at the short interval. What happens at the long interval, the solid line? Activity in amygdala decreases for black faces and increases for white faces, bringing them closer together. As though this automatic fearful response we have in our amygdala is being suppressed by controlled processes, prefrontal cortex and anterior cingulate cortex. Here are more MRI scans at the longer viewing time, showing increased activity in dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex in A, ventral lateral prefrontal cortex in C, and the anterior, anterior cingulate cortex in C in B. The prefrontal cortex is itself a subregion of the frontal cortex. So the frontal cortex is probably all this brain region here. Prefrontal cortex is about here. And there are important subregions of the prefrontal cortex, the dorsal lateral and the ventral medial. These are subregions of a subregion of the cortex. And yes, the subregions of the prefrontal cortex have distinct functions. But neuroscientists are still trying to figure those out. So I often will just refer to the prefrontal cortex more generally. But keep in mind that in many contexts, the subregion of this subregion are functionally important. In the middle, we see the anterior cingulate cortex. This structure here is called the corpus callosum. This is actually a big bundle tract, a big bundle of axons, nerve fibers, myelinated nerve fibers. And they link the hemispheres bilaterally. They allow inter interhemispheric interaction in your brain. It's actually larger in females than in males. Cortex right above the corpus callosum is the cingulate cortex. Anterior cingulate cortex is in the front, posterior cingulate cortex is in the back. The anterior cingulate cortex is active in this task. Recall that the anter anterior cingulate cortex monitors conflict. And if it detects conflict, it recruits the prefrontal cortex to help resolve the conflict. 
what we see in the Cunningham experiment is a biased initial short latency, fast fear response in the amygdala, which is in conflict with the desires that have been internalized not to be prejudiced. Anti-singular cortex detects this conflict and engages the prefrontal cortex to resolve the conflict. And neurophysiologically, what the prefrontal cortex through the anterior singular cortex is doing is it's inhibiting the fear response in the amygdala. That's depicted in this diagram here, where we see the prefrontal cortex. And here they're putting in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex again. I often will just lump the whole thing together into prefrontal cortex, working through anterior singular cortex to suppress the response in the amygdala. This diagram even shows the amygdala communicating with the, hippocamp with the, hypothalamus, the hypothalamus, which is gonna also mediate automatic responses. This is a crucial diagram. It not only illustrates what's happening in the important Cunningham experiment, but it also shows in general how prefrontal cortex works through the anterior singular cortex to control automatic responses in the amygdala, hypothalamus, insula, and other places. Controlled processes, controlling automatic processes. A central theme of the course. What guides our controlled processes? Well, the other stuff in our brains, moral values and ethical principles that we have internalized from culture. What about genetics? Can genetics influence our prejudice responses? Probably. Here's a really interesting experiment, or not experiment, but genetic phenomenon. Williams syndrome, WS, results from a deletion of a series of genes on chromosome seven. So in Williams syndrome individuals, this whole band of genes is missing. This, is, this probably corresponds to 30 or 40 genes in here. Individuals with WS are missing 30 or 40 genes. There's 30 or 40 proteins they just don't have. This has profound consequences on many aspects of phenotype, including the, this very characteristic facial structure for WS individuals. But their brains also respond differently. In this very inter interesting experiment by Meyer Lindenberg, they're taking MRI scans of normal controls and of, of Williams syndrome individuals and they're showing them scary things, either scary threatening faces or scary threatening scenes. So the scary threatening faces can be people making angry, you know, violent, menacing expressions. And the scenes would be things like high places, snakes, fires, stuff like that. And these scary things activate the amygdala. In this column over here, they're finding the difference between the WS individuals and normal individuals. So this is just a different column. And what they show is that the normal controls res will respond there with a amygdala fear response that's very intense to threatening faces and also to threatening scenes. But in fact, normal people will respond in their amygdala more actively for scary faces than for scary scenes. The Williams syndrome subjects also respond to scary scenes. In fact, even more so than the normal controls. You can see the difference is the WS individuals have more amygdala response to scary scenes than the normal folks. However, they have almost no fear response to scary faces, whereas the normal folks have a very um, active amygdala in response to scary faces. The WS individuals show almost no amygdala activity in response to scary faces, and the difference is negative. WS individuals are not responding with fear to human faces, whether they look threatening or not. This leads to an interesting question. If prejudice is based on fear, fear due to bias for no other reason than bias, would WS individuals show less prejudice? Would they show less bias? Here's another interesting experiment by Meyer Lindenberg's team. 
looking at children ages 5 to 16 with and without Williams syndrome. They were shown images of pairs of aged matched people of different races or sexes. For different races, the children were asked to choose which individual was kind, nice, etc. For different sexes, children were asked to choose which was more likely to fix the toaster or bake cookies. This kind of reminds us of our example of the IAT, where we showed a jackhammer or feather dusters and asked whether they would belong to John or Mary. Both control and WS children exhibited significant sex role bias. But racial bias was lower for the WS than for control children and was not statistically different from 50% for the WS folks, which signifies no racial bias. So here's the data, Here, here's examples of the images. And here's the sex role bias, that if you showed someone a picture of a, of a man in overalls, uh, they probably think that this guy would fix the toaster and this, this uh, lady here uh, carrying a purse would be the one who baked the cookies. So pretty much kids had that sex role bias for, for good or bad. What about racial attitudes? They were significantly lower for the WS group and not, not different from 50%, which means, means the WS kids were basically just guessing. They had no bias, no racial bias. Is this related to the, to the fact that they have no fear response to people's faces in the amygdala? WS individuals are known for being warm and friendly toward everybody, regardless of what they look like. They have a serious genetic abnormality, but they are kind of loving to everyone. They present a very, very interesting case. When we talk about automatic responses, when we talk about automatic responses versus controlled pro responses, control processes, we think of the automatic processes as innate, like we're born with them, like we're born with a fear of snakes, or we're born with a fear of people who are different from us. And to some extent, that's true. They are, the automatic processes are in part innate but they also are in part learned. What distinguishes automatic processes from control processes really is that the automatic processes are automatic and they happen fast. They have to happen fast. We almost need them to survive. Um, if something behind you roars really loudly, you've got to get out of the way because it could be a hungry tiger. You don't want to stand around and wonder, I wonder what that roar, would it be appropriate for me to run away when I hear an angry roar? No, you just run away. And so our innate urges are partly inherited, but they're also partly learned. And they're learned basically through experience with life. As we go through life, like the aplesia getting buffeted around in the surf, if a situation that we might seem threatening turns out not to be threatening on repeated exposures, we'll have less of an automatic fear response in that case. So what automatic processes really do is they learn what is and isn't threatening through experience with the world. And that experience can be day-to-day -day experience, day-to-day -day observations. You're walking through a construction site and most of the construction workers are male, so you think jackhammers belong to them. But it can also be experienced with the world in our head, with our controlled processes. Our controlled thoughts can also help to shape our automatic responses. So automatic responses are to some extent learned. They're automatic in the sense that they happen fast and happen before or without awareness, okay? However, Automatic prejudicial responses are not fixed, but can be modulated. And according to Blair in this very interesting article, which you can download for free if you want to, through PubMed or Google Scholar, is that prejudice responses are not fixed, but can be modulated by self and social motives, specific strategies, focus of attention, configuration of stimulus cues, and individual characteristics. 
So let's show some examples of all of, of these different factors that can modulate prejudice responses, automatic prejudice responses. One way is through counter stereotypes. Through stereotype, we think the jackhammer belongs to John. But if we passed a construction site every day and saw mostly female construction workers over time, we might have an automatic response that would associate the jackhammer with Mary and vice versa with the feather duster. But I don't know what's going on with this guy. I'm not sure if he's going to dust the furniture or run a marathon, but he's a counterexample. Another way that experiences can affect our prejudice responses in, is in the workplace. And studies have shown that a positive appraisal of a white from a black supervisor can reduce automatic stereotype responses on the part of the white person. This reveals something really, really important about racial prejudice, about group affiliation, and about in-group solidarity and between-group animosity that on a, on a kind of a low automatic level, we think or feel that people of our group are on our side and that people in the other group are, are not on our side, that they're against us. We feel that people in our group are gonna cooperate with us and help us achieve our goals. And people in, the, in our out groups are going to try to thwart our goals. They don't wanna to try to help us. But if you're on the job and the boss gives you a raise and a promotion, and the boss is from an out group. Now you see that someone from the out group is very much trying to help you. You start to see them as on your side, and this greatly reduces automatic prejudiced feelings. Experiments show that pre-exposure can reduce automatic stereotype responses. And in this particular experiment, subjects were shown well-liked blacks, white subjects, were shown well-liked blacks and disliked whites. So everybody knows that that's Martin Luther King and that's Nelson Mandela. This is an image of Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby was a comedian and actor who was very famous when I was growing up. And he did a tremendous amount to bring the races together in America, to reduce racial tensions in America through his humor and his acting and his advocacy. And he was a very good guy. But more recently, he was charged and convicted with aggravated indecent assault. And he's currently in jail for that. So if this experiment were done today, it probably wouldn't include Bill Cosby and the good guy side. These are disliked white guys. This, of course, is Hitler. This is Timothy McVeigh, who is the American terrorist. He blew up a government building and killed like 350 people, some of whom were children in the nursery of the government building. This is Jeffrey Dahmer, who raped and tortured, killed, and cannibalized people. Um, so back the, at the time this experiment was done, these individuals would definitely have been good guys, and these individuals definitely would have been bad guys. And if, in this particular experiment, all the good guys were black and all the bad guys were white. What did that do? Well, the IAT test first established anti-black bias on the part of the white subjects. Okay, so these are white subjects, eh, probably like us who have internalized desires not to be prejudiced, but they still have automatic responses that are prejudiced. And the subjects are shown many 40 pictures over a session of about 15 minutes of well-liked blacks, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, and disliked whites, Hitler, etc. The subjects were retested on the IAT and the bias vanishes. It didn't just get less, it went away. After 15 minutes, all it took was 15 minutes. Yeah, all it took was 15 minutes. And the anti-black bias in this experiment went away, which is good news. But you have to take that with a grain of salt because if you can decrease 
biased responses in 15 minutes, you can increase them again in 15 minutes. This goes to show that the automatic responses evolve to respond fast to things that could be threatening. And they're partly innate. What we're afraid of is partly innate. But what we're afraid of is, is partly learned. And it's learned through our experience with the world, like the aplesia getting buffeted around in the surf. If things that we might initially be afraid of aren't threatening to us, then we're, we don't have an automatic threatened response anymore. We don't have an automatic fear response anymore. We don't have prejudice against it anymore. So your experience with the world can change, not just modulate, but change your automatic responses. This happens through exposure to the world. But when people talk about or even just think about their tolerant attitude, the activity of prefrontal cortex increases while the activity in the amygdala decreases in response to images of people of other races. So when we talk about experience with the world that can change our automatic responses, we're talking about day-to-day -day experience, your day-to-day -day observations of the world outside. But it's also the world inside. It's inside your head. Yes, through the values you internalize from society into your controlled processes, just by thinking those thoughts, you can actually change the fearful responses in your amygdala, which is amazing. It shows you how important uh, your internalized values are. They have a profound effect on you as a person. So, where do these biased responses come from in the first place? Well, probably cooperation and competition evolved together. They co-evolved. Cooperation between human beings, altruism specifically and, and cooperation more generally, gave groups of people an advantage over other groups which did not have cooperation, in which members did not cooperate well with each other. The important point is that the benefit of cooperation, of trust, of helping each other, only provided a reproductive advantage against other groups, groups which did not cooperate. The cooperation mainly achieved its reproductive advantage in competition with other groups. So nice feelings and pro-social behavior evolved to occur between members of the same group. Hostility and aggression evolved between members of different groups. So all of these great feelings that we have, all of these great pro-social instincts that we have are mainly directed toward people in our in-group. If we perceive them as being in the out-group, those warm and fuzzy feelings don't apply. And back then, in the days when one tribe fought another tribe, these, the fear of the other, automatic stereotype responses to anybody who was in your outgroup was what kept you alive. Now, of course, those responses are no longer appropriate. We don't live in a world of tribal warfare anymore. We live in the civilized world um, with governments and police who uphold the laws most of the time. And stereotype responses are just no longer appropriate. Just as we use our controlled processes to control our rather innate behaviors, we need our control processes to control our group-oriented behaviors and our biases toward people who we perceive as being in our outgroup. So how do we control that? Well, we did talk about our own thought processes, that through our, the way we conceive the world will affect our behavior, even very fast behavior toward other people, including people from our outgroups. Here's another suggestion. The supergroup idea. The common in-group identity approach to combating biases emphasizes recategorization, whereby members of different groups conceive of themselves as a single, more inclusive supergroup rather than as two separate groups. Some studies show that this can reduce intergroup bias. But what often happens is that 
They foster a dual identity in which members at once belong to a supergroup and to their original group. So this can extend benefits to the minority who would like to, pre to preserve its distinctiveness, but it can lead to resentment on the part of my, the majority who prefers the single identity idea. So the supergroup idea doesn't really always work out that well. It often leaves you with the same problem you've started off with. A better way involves strong attachments to people of different groups. In a huge meta-analysis of intergroup relations involving different races, but also nationalities, ethnicities, ages, disabilities, etc., from all over the world, the main thing that reduces stereotypes are emotional involvements, like friendships and romances that make people more accepting. The contact has to be strong, casual contact is not enough, but the strong emotional contact removes prejudice or takes a negative emotional tone away from it. One of the best examples of this are sports, organized sports for kids in grammar school and high school. Now in the United States, boys and girls participate equally in sports because of Title IX, a law that says that public institutions that have sports programs have to divide the resources evenly between males and females. So lots of kids are playing sports. Lots of kids are playing team sports. And a lot of the teams will have kids of different backgrounds, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, right? And what you end up with are now kind of tribes battling with each other on the soccer field or the football field who were composed of individuals of different races and ethnicities. The shared goal and the, and the, the strong emotional attachment that that builds reduces racial tensions within the team. But basically, any contact you have across, across group divides is going to decrease bias. Here's a nice picture of some girls cuddling a kitten. And they're obviously of different races and ethnicities, but they seem to not care about that. They're all completely intent on this little kitten that they all want to touch. And they're really united by their common humanity here because all these little girls have a nurturing instinct. And they care about that kitten. They don't care about the fact that they're of different races and ethnicities. And I would guess that most of you already know. I think most of you already do reach out across group divides. I think you probably are already doing that. And I think that you very quickly learn when you do that, that we can be united by our common humanity and that racial differences really don't mean anything and should not be a factor in our relationships with each other in society. I'll end there. <laughs>